Hey guys, welcome back to the fourth video. Today's topic is on biological interactions. You can find this in the textbook. So I finished up chapter two and chapter three is on looking at interactions of species with other living things and with their physical surroundings. We'll also look at how ecosystems can be measured to determine their health. Purpose of today's lesson is to look at how biotic and abiotic factors limit the distribution of species in an ecosystem. So what is an ecosystem? It comes under the banner of ecology when we look at this. And ecology is the study of relationships between organisms and their environment. It comes from the Greek word oikos, which means home. We're looking at how living things interact with their home. And if you're doing it right now, as you're watching this video, you're interacting with the light, with the temperature, the air surrounding you, as well as with the living things, be that other people or even the bacteria that covers our skin. In this image, the fish are interacting with the salinity, saltiness of the water, the pH, the sunlight, the temperature, the currents, as well as the other living species in this environment. You would know by now that scientists like to classify things and ecology, we have this system here. It's called Bebek P and the first B stands for biosphere. This is the, the region of earth that all living things inhabit. So if there's water, there's life. Within a biosphere is a biome, the second B. And a biome is a large area with its own climate. It is made up of different species as well as abiotic factors. Within a biome is an ecosystem, and this could just be a pond, it could be a decaying log. An ecosystem is how living things interact with their abiotic factors. Within an ecosystem, we could talk about the community, and that is just the living species in the ecosystem. Then within a community, there are different populations. That's the total number of one species. And then within a population, we have the individual. So what makes up an ecosystem? Well, all living things can be grouped into four categories based on their feeding lifestyle. To begin with, we have producers. Producers take sunlight and convert it into energy. Here's an image of a mass algal bloom off the coast of Florida taken from space. Algae, as well as plants and flowers, do this process of photosynthesis. There's also a type of bacteria called chemosynthetic bacteria, which take chemicals from around them to create their own food. After producers, we have consumers. There are different levels of consumers based on what they eat. So the ones that eat the producers, well, they're herbivores, right? And they're called first order consumers. And we have second order consumers. And if the second order consumers eat the first order consumers, then they would be carnivores. But then there's also different species, such as the possum, that could be an omnivore, meaning they eat herbivores and producers. So possums eat both insects as well as fruit and leaves. And then we could have further higher order consumers to an apex predator. Uh, we have after that decomposers and decomposers are fungi or mushrooms and they release enzymes onto decaying matter um, to break down large molecules into smaller molecules. They're super important for an ecosystem because they recycle matter back into the producers. There's another special type of consumer and they're called detritivores or just detrivores and they're earthworms for example they're also important um, as they break down large matter into smaller matter that can be recycled back into the producers um, interesting fact the largest earthworm ever recorded was 22 feet long back in 1967 in africa found by the side of the road that's seven meters long massive so let's just talk about abiotic environmental factors for a sec 
Abiotic factors can be temperature, salinity, currents, wind, everything that we've mentioned in class. And different species have different tolerance ranges of abiotic factors. Within their optimum range, we can call that their niche, there is the greatest number of species. But as those abiotic factors vary or as they move out of their optimum reach, it's the zone of physiological stress. And then there's the zone of intolerance where the species just cannot survive. So for example, we could talk about um, the coral reef system. They have been under significant stress lately due to um, rising temperatures and increasing acidity of water. This was taken from the National Geographic and it says half of the Great Barrier Reef has been bleached to death since 2016. Obviously an indication of the, the coral being in significant physiological stress. The way this happens is actually there's a relationship that's going on between an algae, it's called Zeuxanthellae. This algae lives within the tips or polyps of the coral. The algae uh, are photosynthetic and they produce nutrients for the coral and the coral provides a home for the algae. However, when temperatures increase, the algae leave the coral to find cooler temperatures, therefore allowing the coral just to starve to death. And that's what happens when the algae leaves, they take their color with them and that's why um, we see bleached reefs um, indicating death of the coral. Uh, different organisms have different ranges. So the limpet, which you can find on the intertidal zone of a shoreline at Noosa, at Coulomb, um, intertidal means they live where the tide can be out or the tide can be in. They have a big range that they live in here. Imagine in high tide, they're covered in water, they're being buffeted by waves, but in low tide, they're exposed to the sun and the wind and other predators. The way that they uh, can, can still survive in these harsh conditions is by they actually have an adaptation that allows them to clamp down to the rock and they create their own micro environment inside. Another example of an organism um, that is under significant physiological stress, it's being pushed out of its, its niche due to fluctuating abiotic factors is the polar bear. Uh, due to reducing ice sheets uh, and therefore reducing numbers of prey to feed upon, uh, their numbers are significantly decreasing as well. However, the greatest uh, contributor to mortality of polar bears has actually been hunting for their fur for handicrafts, uh, which is quite sad, hey? So we'll keep moving on. Those were abiotic factors. How do biotic factors? Um, affect distribution and abundance of species. Well, there's a graph that you'll find in your textbook, sorry, a table, that shows there are different types of relationships. Before we get into that, I'll show you this one word, symbiosis. It is one of the most famous words in biology and it refers to a relationship between two organisms. Now that relationship can be positive or it can be negative, or it can be both. And this table shows that. Of the different types of relationships, if there is a plus, it means it's uh, positive towards that species. If there's a minus, there's a negative effect. And if there's a zero, it means there's neutral, no effect. So the first one, first symbiotic relationship we'll look at is mutualism. And mutualism benefits both species involved. An example of that we've already talked about. Zeuxanthellae algae live within coral polyps, providing nutrients to the coral and the coral providing a home uh, to the Zeuxanthellae. You would notice the image on the very first slide with the clownfish in the anemone. That's another classic example. Cooperation 
is the same thing. It benefits both. However, it is not essential to their survival. Commensalism is where one organism species benefits and the other is unaffected. And a prime example of this is the egret feeding uh, on the insects that live on the cattle. So the cattle is obviously unaffected as the egret benefits from that relationship. Immensalism is when one is not affected and the other species is negatively affected. Example of this is how mold secretes antibiotics and those antibiotics kill bacteria that may be surrounding them. And that is actually how penicillin was accidentally discovered. Parasitism and predation are similar, where one species benefits and the other species is negatively impacted. Parasitism is where there is a host required and it is at their expense that the parasite thrives. This is an image of a tapeworm that can live within the guts, intestines of organisms. Predation, obviously, if an organism is being eaten, it is being negatively affected by the other. Competition is interesting where multiple species may be competing over the same resource where they can either both negatively be impacted here or one may benefit still at the expense of another. So these terms are important and based on the mock exam example questions, uh, you, you need to know what each of these means. Here is an example taken from the mock exam. So there's, a, there's four or so questions coming up. I won't read through them, but you can just pause the video and answer these in your own time. Uh, and I'll check these in class. Question number one. Question number two. Symbiotic inter interaction. Now we're talking about niches in question three. And lastly, the figure below shows a model of ecological niche occupations by various species. And the question is to identify which two species are occupying the same niche. Guys, that is all for today. I hope you are liking these videos and I will see you in class.